People in the world are willing to hustle for material things, but I don't know why people of the light aren't willing to hustle for spiritual things. We have been in a series called The God Who Can't Be Ignored. It's been all around the fear of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I have been very, very challenged uh, in this series. Uh, doing the, the study on this has pushed me forward. Uh, we have been in, I don't even know, it's like week number six, something like that. And I think I got a couple, I think we got a couple more weeks still in this. But today, I want to give us a little bit of a refresher going back to the beginning. The very first week, uh, we shared a quote from Charles Spurgeon uh, that talked about how the fear of God is, uh, is, is a mighty, powerful thing because it chases away all other fears. It's like a mighty lion that, that stands intimidating is what Charles Spurgeon is trying to communicate in this quote, trying to let every other fear know you cannot have this person. So the fear of God is not something that just is good like for the Bible theologically, but, but this thing has the ability to impact all these other things that we're navigating, these other fears that we have in our lives. We, we talked about this, you might remember, if the God you serve can be tamed, then it's not the God of the Bible. Anybody remember this? Maybe you remember uh, the, the big swan that I brought out. Does anybody remember this, the big swan? Okay, I think I got a picture of the swan. Uh, so we, we had the big swan, and, and we're talking about going down a lazy river as compared to whitewater rafting. And many of us in our walk with God, it's like he's, you know, we're on a lazy river. You can control it. You can get in and out of it whenever you want to. And many of us in our walk with God are treating God like that. I'll jump in if things are going bad, but if they're going good, I'll leave my walk with God, go do what I want to go do for a while. And we just kind of were wrestling through, talking through all of that. I, I want to give this definition of the fear of the Lord. I wrote it down and put it on the screen for us. So look at this definition here uh, real quick. This is important because we're going to be using this later. The fear of the Lord refers to a profound respect, reverence, and awe for God. Recognizing his supreme authority, power, and holiness. This type of fear is not about being scared or anxious, but about acknowledging God's greatness and aligning one's life in accordance with his will. This is a really robust definition. We gave some shorter ones, but this robust definition is really, really important for us because we're about to talk today about another God who can't be ignored. We've got the God who can't be ignored. That's the big G. But today we're going to talk about another God who can't be ignored. It's a little G. And this little G God who can't be ignored is the God of money. Try to ignore it. <laughs> this God shows up everywhere. This little G God is messing with so many different areas of our lives. This little G God is uh, trying to run us and rule our minds. And I want you to see in the definition I just gave of the fear of the Lord, I want to replace fear of the Lord with the fear of money. Let me put it on the screen for us. The fear of money refers to a profound respect reverence, and awe for money. Recognizing its supreme authority, power, and holiness. This type of fear is about being scared or anxious and about acknowledging money's greatness and aligning one's life in accordance with its will. I don't know about y'all, but I, I read that and I was like, oh, shoot. Because I want to say I fear the Lord, right? Yeah, and I read that definition. I'm like, yeah, I want this. But then when I was being challenged with this particular text and this other little G God who can't be ignored, this thought popped into my head. What if I, what if I read this definition differently? And I'm 
Sad to say, there have been many times in my life that the fear of money has been greater in my life than the fear of the Lord. Now, there is no shame that we have to throw, no shade to put on anybody. And at the end of this, we're not asking you for anything. But I am believing today is going to be a day of freedom. I have been on my knees crying out for my own heart and crying out for our church's heart that we would not be a people that are enslaved to the fear of money. I've been asking that this parasite that has been living in us, sucking life from us, and many times even living dormant, and we would think it's not even there, would be something that the Spirit of God today in Frisco, online, and in this room would be broken off of our lives. And I'm praying this for teenagers, and I'm praying this for single people and married people. I'm praying this for people who are engaged. I'm praying this for all of us because God is calling us to be rooted and established and to go to a higher level in Him, and something is trying to hold us back and keep us in prison but today I'm believing chains are going to fall off of us that is my hope and my prayer how do I know this fear of money is a real thing because pretty much every single thing we do we ask the question how can I afford it come on e -e everything don't don't be don't pretend like you don't know what I'm talking about this is there I'm you in this when I was reading this I was like man Lord I don't want to preach this this is me I want to preach things that I'm free from, that, I'm, that I, I've got everything all together. I'm strong. Oh, man, this one, I'm like, oh, shoot, I didn't realize some of this was still attached to me. How can I afford it? How can I afford it? Let me talk to our smallest population, currently our smallest population here at Shoreline City Church. Not the most, not, not a population we don't care about, one we have been praying for, and that's the old heads, okay? We've been praying for more unks in this church. We have been praying for more grandmas and grandpas. Come on, give it up for the old heads. Come on, give it up for them. We've been praying for receding hairlines, comb overs. We've been praying. Older people come to the church and they're like, man, there's, no, hope. there's nobody here like me. I'm like, hey, we've been praying for you. Stay, just stay, just stay a little while longer. We're all going to get there. So if you are at that stage of life, you're asking yourself questions, how can I afford retirement? How can I afford it? Because a social security check, from what I understand, doesn't usually cover retirement. You are, you're asking yourself, and for a quick side note, you know, the whole 65 retirement age, it's like from 1881, you know that, right? So I don't even love the idea of us like stopping doing anything, you know, at 65. I think 65 is still young, and you still got a lot on the other tank. You might not have to work at their current job, but you're still working for the kingdom of God. I think there's still more on the inside of you and more things for you to do and lives for you to touch and, 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 and ministry that you can accomplish. But with that being said, you're like, man, how, how can I afford, how can I afford re retirement? But I know a lot of us live in, like, how can I, I want to go out to eat. How can I afford that? Because guac is extra. If guac is extra, <laughs> I'm so glad Chipotle stopped asking that question. You, you know it's extra, right? Yeah, I know it's extra. I've seen the meme. <laughs> Put it on there. I, I, I want to go out to eat. Do I have the money to afford that? I want to get engaged. Can I afford a ring? I want to get married. Can I afford a venue, florist, uh, dress, uh, Reception, uh, go down, honeymoon. I, I want to have kids. Can I afford diapers? I want to have another kid. Can I afford this in my marriage? Because <laughs> we ain't talked for about two and a half years. And we're going to bring another human being into this thing. Uh, can, can, I, can I afford it? Can I afford it? Can I afford it? I want, can, I, oh, man, I want a house. God, would you bless me with a house? Can I afford it? Down payment, closing costs, furniture. There's every, everything that you and I turn to. It's like, oh I, I want, oh, I want a new car. Tires, maintenance, insurance. Man, this insurance, I can't stand that whole insurance thing. I should get some of this money back at some point in time, I feel like. 
you go down the line. Vacation. Plane ticket. Hotel. Airbnb. Wait, I got a friend that lives there. Maybe they'll let me stay on their couch. I'm going to have to give them a little something. $75? $75 good? You got all, every single thing you and I want to do, we are asking the question, do, can I afford it? Do I have the money to do this thing? No, it, it, it escapes, I'll say none of us, some of us, you know, you're like, actually, I'll never ask that question. <laughs> I want you to know we're glad you're here at this church too. We've been praying for you too. <laughs> We've been praying that God would bring you and he would use you for his glory in this church. <laughs> but, but most of us, we're like, man, can I, can I, can I? But the reality is, no matter really what level you are at, there's always somebody kind of a little bit ahead of you and you have to ask yourself that question. Can I, can I? I want to. Um, I talked about Nate and Whitley Louder, uh, who, are, who are here, and uh, they were, Nate was an engineer. I guess once an engineer, always an engineer, Nate. I don't know what they say in the engineering world. Uh, but he, he was an engineer. Where'd you graduate from? Was it Texas Tech? Yeah, Texas, Texas Tech. Uh, is that right? <laughs> Wait, what is it? How does it go? Is it like this? Okay, like that. I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know. Uh, Texas Tech. Uh, Whitney was a nurse. Where'd you go to school, Whitney? University of Wyoming, wow, okay, so I didn't even know they had a school. So University of Wyoming, <laughs> sounds amazing. She was a, she was a, a, a nursing major, and uh, we met these guys right before they were even engaged. They came to the church. We were meeting at the Angelica Movie Theater uh, here in Dallas. I mean, there was probably maybe, maybe 120 people in the church at this time. Maybe. And I remember having them uh, stand up like, hey, Nate and Whitney just got engaged. And they were so embarrassed. They were like. They stood up, and then they were a part of the serve team and went through join, and, and just, it was beautiful to see what God was doing in their life. And then one day they came uh, to us, and they were saying, hey, we have been trying to, uh, we, we feel called to the mission field. So we have been setting up our lives financially to get rid of all of our debt so that when God calls us, we can go. I had heard people talk about stuff like this before. I had never met anybody that had actually done that. Because here they have a call on their heart that they feel is from the Lord. And what I have discovered is whether it's a call to leave, to leave um, you know, the marketplace and go to vocational ministry or you are in the marketplace and you feel called to go start something, do something. People, we have a dream for something and we might even have the discipline for it, but a lot of times we don't have the dollars for it. So God is asking me to do something that I can't do, not because I don't want to do it. I can't afford it. I can't afford to go on the mission field. I can't afford to invite this homeless person in. I can't afford to help end sex trafficking. I can't afford fill in the blank. I've got the desire to do it. I want to. I can't afford it. And here is this fear of money standing there, intimidating us, looking over your shoulder. Every time you pull up your Bank of America or your Chase app while you're in the line, I'll be, yeah, I'll be there in just a second, y'all. I'll be there in just a second. Yeah. Beep. <laughs> Whew. Thank you, God. I'm talking where real people live. Can I afford it? You can't do it. You can't take that step of faith. Why would you trust God like that? You're going to look like a fool. You're going to look like an idiot. I thought God's the provider. Giving ladder my behind. 
I ain't giving light of nothing. I'm trying to stay here and stay afloat. How can I afford it? Now, some of us, I, I like our church, I like our church a whole bunch, actually. I, I, I love y'all, but I actually like you, too. I have to love you. I don't have to like you. And I, I love you, and I like you. I like, I like this church. I like the people that God brings, because God brings a lot of drivers here. Drivers, like, not like car drivers, but I want to make something happen. I want to do something. And, and I, I, I like that, because I like to think I'm built the same way. It's like, let's move forward. You're moving too slow. Let's go. Let's go faster. No, not, not fast enough. Faster, faster. Faster, faster, faster. It's like, let's go take ground. Let's move forward. Let's make things happen. I like that. Now, that can be a problem, and it can become an idol for sure. But I like to think God made us like this. So, God, thank you so much for giving us a drive to want to do something in our generation. I do not take steps back that God wants hired us to kick down the gates of hell and make it on earth as it is in heaven. I, I want him to purify us, yes, and cleanse us, but I'm not trying to sit back and chill and just wait for God to do everything when God's like, hey, I put you on the earth to do something on my behalf. I love how we run. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, with that being said, sometimes we can say things, we can pray prayers like this. God, I don't want much. I just need enough for me my family. That's really it, God. How am I asking for too much? And I know that prayer sounds good, but that prayer is selfish. I don't think you ought to just pray just for me and my family to be good. I think it's okay to pray it. I'm not trying to throw any shame or shade on anybody. But I think God wants you to pray bigger prayers than that. I think God wants you to pray prayers like, Lord, yes, I want you to take care of me. And yes, I want you to take care of my family. But Lord, would you bless me in such a way that if there is someone broken down on the side of the road, I don't have to walk past them. But instead, God, I can pick them up and put them in my car. And I can bring them to the hotel. And I can pay for their stay. And if it goes even longer, then I can cover that too. Just like the Good Samaritan story that Jesus shared in the Bible. God, would you do something so miraculous in my family that my family is not the one that's always asking for help. I want to be the family that's able to give help. Lord, we have been on the bottom side of this for generation after generation after generation. I want that curse broken in my family. I don't want to live like this anymore. I'm not asking to be rich. I'm asking to be generous to be able to obey you every time you move on my heart. I can do what you're calling me to do. That's the prayers I want us praying. Go, go with me back to Gospel of Luke. Back, you all still with me? This too much? Okay, uh, Gospel of Luke chapter, uh, Gospel of Luke chapter 16. Go, go, go to the end here real quick. Go to verse number 13. We read this earlier. We read this earlier. No one can serve two masters. Either Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. How many of y'all watched The Gold or Bachelor, Bachelorette <laughs> and are willing to admit it? <laughs> yeah, y'all ain't raising your hand on that. That is... I haven't seen the show. Okay, I have not seen it. What's the lady's name? Who's doing it? Jeff Joan. Yeah, I knew, I knew y'all would know. I was like, I, Joan. Um, she's in her 60s. And if you don't know what the Golden Bachelorette is, this is someone, a wonderful lady in her 60s. And she's, you know, she's looking for love. And there's all these guys. You, you know The Bachelor. And in The Bachelor, I, I do not watch this show, not because, you know, I'm against it or whatever. Maybe I should be. I don't know. But I, uh, this show, I've heard, I've got some friends that have been a part of it. And God has used that show to minister and help a whole lot of people in different ways. We had a connect group around uh, The Bachelor one year. I don't even know. The Lord blessed it somehow, some way. And people were growing in their walk with Christ, <laughs> watching the show, then talking through things and bringing in the Bible. I said, God, use whatever you want to use for your glory. That's what, that, that's what I say. So, so this show, the, the Golden Bachelorette, is this woman, and there are multiple options for guys, and she's got to figure out, you know, which one am I going to 
be with. And you have, you got the roses, right? You got the roses and you want the final rose. Am I getting this right? Am I messing this up? You get the final rose. Only one person gets a rose at the end. Only one person. So even the golden bachelorette knows you can't give a rose to everyone. At some point, you've got to decide who gets the final rose. The show does not work by saying, hey, Golden Bat Joan, what you can do is you get to keep two guys. And the guys go, hey, yeah, you want to share her? We all know that's gross. That's cringe. It's weird. You know those other TV shows that are out there? It's like, I got four wives. It's like, bruh, why? <laughs> why would you do that to yourself? And ladies, why would you allow this man to do that to you? The Golden Bachelorette is coming to a culmination where we know there might be two guys left, but only one is getting the rose. Jesus here says, you can't serve two masters. You can't marry both men. You can't marry both ladies. You've got to give one a rose. And I was asking myself the question, man, who'd I give the rose to? I mean, I want to say I gave it to God. That's what I want to say. God's got my rose. Love you, Lord. I'm a pastor. Of course he has my, look. Uh, I mean, I'm a man of the cloth. Of course God ha has my rose, of course. I mean, how could he not? I'm, I'm doing ministry. I serve people for a living. That's my, my life doesn't even belong to me. It has been given over to God and to serve people. This is not for me, Lord. This is for your kids and your church. But I had to ask myself, huh. Because you kind of know who you're serving based on who you obey. You know who you're serving based on who you sacrifice for. I mean, look at you. Look at me. If you had the chance, you had to work every day, 10 hours a day. But you knew if you did that for one year, you couldn't go to church. You wouldn't be able to be at family dinners. You'd miss some games. You wouldn't be at a connect group. But for one year, you had to do that. And you had to work all those hours. And you knew all your bills would be taken care of. I think every single one of us in here, everyone at Frisco, everybody online would be like, I'll take that deal. So you and I would be willing to exchange spiritual health, mental health, emotional health, for financial strength. Why? Because we think money solves all of our problems. Because we got the fear of money. It's running our lives. Again, I don't want anybody wearing any guilt. I'm in this with you. Because money, it's sneaky. It's sneaky. Well, not, not just money. Money's amoral. It's not money in and of itself. It's just what the Bible called love of money. I just kind of switched it around, called it the fear of money. But the same idea that it becomes this thing that we think we put our trust in in order for our lives to be whole and complete. And Jesus here says, Jesus says it. This trip me out. Why would Jesus talk about money? 
I mean, he's a savior. Why would he talk about money? Why would a, why would a parable like this even be in the Bible? I mean, this, doesn't, this shouldn't be in the Bible. Why, why would this even matter? Because Jesus knew all the way back in his day, and they weren't even a capitalist, capitalist society, and here they are back in his day, and money is still running religious people, and money is still running church people, and running, money is still run, r- running political people, and money is still running all different types of society all the way back in Jesus' day because there was an exchange that happened here, and we said, God, I don't know if you're really enough for me. So what I want to do is I'm going to put my hope and my trust in something else. So I have to ask myself, you have to ask yourself, who are you riding with? Is it the fear of God or the fear of money? And you can know, and I can know, based on who I'm willing to sacrifice for. If God asked you to sacrifice some things, some money things, so you can have some eternal things, would you think you were getting the raw end of the deal? But none of us think, I'll say it this way, most of us think it's right to sacrifice spiritual things for material things because we do it all the time. And society does not even bat an eye at it. So we think it's normal. I'm not talking here about you succeeding. I want you to succeed. I'm not here talking about you. Uh, not, you can have a second home. Shoot, you can have a third home. I don't care how many homes you have. That, that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is you and I understanding that the fear of the Lord is more important to us than the fear of money. Because I know even rich people who are bound. Having more of it doesn't make you free. Doesn't make you free. It makes you more of what you already are. Let's keep on going here. Luke, Luke 16. Oh man, this too heavy? This too heavy for y'all? Okay. We're trying to grow here. We're trying to grow. We got some surgery happening here. Woo! Luke chapter 16, verse number one. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So you got a rich man who's, who he had, a, he had a manager who was accused of wasting his Possession. So I like this parable because this is like, this is work stuff. This is like business. You got a guy, he's running the company. He's got a manager and the manager is embezzling money. You can read it later. He's not handling the, the funds correctly. The rich guy owns the company. He's like, hey, I own the company. I'm going to put you in charge. You deal with the vendors. So you got vendors in this. You, uh, the customers maybe may not, might not be in this, but you got owner. You got vendors. You got managers. This is where most of us live right here. And this manager is not stewarding well what this guy has tasked him to do. He's not doing his job appropriately. And, and then the guy comes in. The rich man says, hey, I heard what you've been doing. It ain't right. I'm about to fire you behind. And the guy goes, <laughs> you read it later, he says, well, shoot, if he's going to fire me, I'm not strong enough to dig, <laughs> and I'm too prideful to beg. <laughs> it's so funny. He's like, uh, I- I'm-, I'm used to sitting in my office. I can't do this other thing. So then he decides, I'm going to go out and talk to all these other vendors, and if they owe 1000 I'm going to make them pay 800 If they owe 500 I'm going to make them pay 300 And then they, he does this whole thing, and his boss comes back to him. The, the rich man comes back, and he goes, man, you're smart. Well done. I mean, I'm still about to fire you, but man, you act really shrewdly. And then Jesus starts saying some interesting things. He says, people in the world, they act more shrewdly than the people of the light. One one thing he is saying here is people in the world are willing to hustle for material things, but I don't know why people of the light aren't willing to hustle for spiritual things. Why is it? Let me say it this way. I want to say thank you to so many individuals who know they go above and beyond because you have caught this revelation. 
You have got the un gotten the understanding that I'm not just living for myself. You've gotten the understanding that my life is temporary and that there's something eternal that's going to be happening one day. And because of that, whether you're willing to serve or give or pray or be kind and loving or take your marketplace job and make sure you remember that that is your pulpit, that is your ministry, that is the place where you are the preacher and you are serving and leading people in a way that points them not just to you, but to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to say you're seeing it correctly but so many people not seeing it right so now keep on going with me keep on going with me keep on going with me because I gotta get oh man I got more stuff to get to he told uh the, the master uh, re, go to verse number nine for me verse number nine when you read it in the NIV it sounds weird a little, a little unique I tell you use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves sounds weird so when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So I, I want to read it out of the Amplified Version. I think I have this here for you. I think it will help us understand it a little bit more. And I tell you, learn from this. Make friends for yourselves for eternity by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, money. That is, use material resources as a way to further the work of God so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into the eternal dwellings. I'm gonna put it like this. This shrewd manager who was embezzling money, Jesus is actually highlighting him, saying he started, uh, he started going to the vendors, asking them for less money, because he knew if he got less money from them that they would like him. So when he lost his job, he'd be able to go back out there and he'd have a place to stay. What the, what the shrewd manager was doing is he was doing something here and now that would help him in the then and there. So Jesus is trying to help us understand you can do something in the here and now that will impact then and there. That if you can learn to manage your here and now properly, then you will impact the there and then for eternity. But what the fear of money wants to make you and I do is not ever think about the then and there just wants you to think about the here and now. Here's the big question for all of us. Is God enough? That's the question. Is God enough? We talked, this, uh, talked about this in our connect group on Thursday, our Lyman Bible study. I know we got one in Frisco, uh, too. Got one here in Dallas. We get together at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we have been really diving into Genesis chapter 3, verse number 6 for a number of weeks right now. It says the, this piece of fruit was desirable for gaining wisdom. It was pleasing to the eye. Adam and Eve they thought God was holding out on them. Adam and Eve lived in a garden built for them. And they still felt like they did not have enough. I'll submit to you what I felt God speak to my heart. If God isn't enough, nothing else will ever be enough. I don't know how you get here. How you and I get to the place where we're, this fear of money is being stripped off of us. And we're operating more in the fear of the Lord than the fear of money. But I do know we at least got to deal with some truth. And the truth is Jesus. And what he did on the cross does matter. 
and the grave is empty and God is enough. Well, Earl, I got to pay my bills. I'm not saying you don't have to pay your bills. I'm saying is God enough? Well, what about retirement? I'm saying is God enough? In movies, we love when the hero uh, kind of takes the guy, the girl, and they're like, hey, hey, everything's crazy all around. Like, hey, just look at me. I got this. We love in the movies when the hero takes charge. Like, hey, I know it's all crazy. I got you. We don't like this in life. But I want you to see today Jesus looking at you eyeball to eyeball saying, I got you. I got you. I've got you. Jesus, it doesn't feel like you have me. I got you. Do you see all these letters and phone calls that I'm getting? I got you. Do you know how much pressure I have on my shoulders right now, Jesus? I don't know how I'm going to pay my employees. I got you. At some point in time, we've got to believe these words of Jesus. I'm, I'm going to be all done here. I'm, I'm going to read this last, I'm going to read this text, and we're going to be all done. We're going to read, read, read this. We're going to be all done. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Luke chapter 12, verse 22, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barns, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the wild flower. Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? You of little faith. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. I know guac is extra. Don't worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. He knows. But seek his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Yeah, may God add a blessing to his word. Bow your heads, friends, if you wouldn't mind. Bow your heads just for a moment. Whoo, man, I sense the grace of God. Jesus, over every one of our hearts, over every one of our hearts, may we see you staring into our souls, speaking these words of life. And I'm praying today for transformation to happen in our souls. I pray for a breaking to happen. 
I pray for the things that have been trying, they've been holding us. It's been holding us in bondage. It's been in our sleep. It's been at our dinner table. This fear of money has been in our minds. This fear of money drives with us everywhere we go. We can't get away from it. And in the name of Jesus, over Frisco online and in this room, over every person under the sound of my voice, I am asking for you, Lord God, to step in and to break the back of the enemy. I pray that this chain would be off of our necks. I pray that you would heal us and restore us. You would even forgive us. You would help us and empower us. I ask that today would be a day of change and transformation in the name of Jesus. We look at this ugly giant and we declare that you cannot stand against the armies of the living God. We declare that this giant must fall in the name of Jesus. Our hope is not in money. Our hope hope is not in the economy. Our hope is not in our job. Our hope is not in our 401k or 403b. Our hope is in you and in you alone. So in the name of Jesus, would an open heaven be over this church? Would there be breakthrough over every heart and mind? God, we need this. We ask you for it. We believe you for it. In the name, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Whew. In the name of Jesus. Do it, Lord. As your heads are bowed just for a moment longer. If you're under the sound of my voice and you've never given your heart and your life to Christ, you never made him first, you never made him number one, I, I want to give you an opportunity today to respond to the grace of God because he's calling you closer. If that's you, you've never given your heart and your life to Christ, or at one point in time you did, you slipped away. And today, you're saying, I'm going to rededicate my life to serving Jesus. On the count of three, I just want you to throw your hand in the air and say, yes, that's me. Ready? One, two, three. Just throw your hand up in the air. You're saying, yep, that's me. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Christ. This is beautiful. I've got friends all over the room online. You're saying, yep, that's me. That's me. Friends at Frisco, you're saying, yep, that's me. In the theater, you're saying, yep, that's me. I want to give my heart and my life to Christ. I'm going to ask everyone to put your hand over your heart if you would not mind. Repeat this prayer out loud after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I admit I've made mistakes. And today, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Give me the power to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we lift our heads up, clap our hands.